Um, I want to, uh, to uh, share with you what the Lord has laid on my heart. And I believe that today is a very, uh, it is a very important uh, message that I will preach. Today, uh, I believe, is a message, um, and it's one of the reasons I believe that the enemy, uh, uh, the devil attacks Christians, period. But the devil does attack uh, Christians and churches who he is aware of that sees the uh, hints of where they're going and what we're becoming. And today, I will share with you the truth that is, uh, the truths, you might say, the two major truths that lead into many of the other truths. And so this truth that I will share to you should be a focus uh, and is a focus of Great Life Church. It is the focus of Great Life Church because it is the focus of God. It is the focus of Jesus, our Savior. It is the focus of the Holy Spirit and all that he does in our life today. And I'm here to tell you that it is the focus of the devil, Satan, in order, his focus is to stop us from making it our main focus. How many know that, that the enemy, if he can't stop you, then he wants to change your focus so that you'll waste your time on things that are uh, less important? Less important. He'll do whatever. He can throw whatever kind of junk your way. He can throw, he can throw uh, uh, you know, sickness your way. He can throw uh, uh, financial problems and relationship problems. And he can even throw in, throw in working real hard at something that is very admirable and very good. I mean, I've gotten caught up lots of times in focusing on things that were very admirable and very good, but yet they weren't the great that God called us to be involved in. Amen. Now, we can't just leave the good out. The good is a part of us. The good is a part of being who we are. But the great or the most important, the number one, two of what God, I believe, intends for us to do while we walk the face of this earth. And today, I will share with you, and I hope there's some conviction in the house about shortcomings. I hope there's some convictions about well, I guess I've kind of got caught up in a lot of other stuff. That I've let the enemy deceive me by using good, or I've gotten focused, fo uh, caught up in some things that aren't quite what God uh, intends for us to be and do. Amen? So you see, because I believe the message that I will uh, share with you today, it, it is going to be a beginning of a series that I believe will change the world. Wow. Tell your neighbor that's a, uh, that's a big, uh, a big uh, goal. We got to say that. How about you? That's a big goal. Big goal. I believe this will change the world. I believe this will change your world. I believe it has the power to change your children's world. You see, I believe that the church is the last great hope for this world. How many believe this world's a mess? This world's a mess. It's a mess. They're killing each other. It ain't just with guns. They're stabbing. They're running. Somebody shoved a young girl onto a subway a couple of weeks. Just killed her. Why? Sounds like he wanted to go back to prison. He was in prison. He didn't seem to be doing too well on the outside. And so I guess he chose that to be the way so that he would never get out again. I have no idea. I have no idea why somebody takes a car and runs it through a parade and runs people down from the backside and kills lots of people. Why? This world is a mess and things in it are a mess. And even around us, things happen in this town that are, that are crazy that I don't even understand. And the world is a mess. And I believe that some people want to rely on politics. And, and I do believe that we should go vote. And I believe we should vote what the Bible says, not what fills our pocketbook. Is that true? Amen. 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 And, and I believe that, 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 that what the Bible says, we should vote. And yes, uh, as far as the voting thing goes, I, I, I don't tell you who or what to vote for most time. But I preach the word of God and believe that you should let the word of God guide you. Amen. 
And I'm not ashamed to talk about it one-on-one -on -one in person. You ever want to talk about it in person? Then yes, I will tell you what I have believed, what God's word says. Therefore, I preach through this. And yes, I have to deal with the same thing. All, all politicians do something that God likes. Is that true? I think they do. I think all politicians do something that's good. And all politicians do things that are bad. <laughs> But I have to then look at it and say, well, what is super bad? Does that make sense? What is breaking the main rules, the stuff that God cares for about mostly? And so, yes, there are things like that. And I believe in that. But let me tell you something. Politics will not, will not be the savior of this world. Money will not be the savior of this world. In actuality, the church is the last hope for the world. And the church is the last hope because that's the hands that God left the world in. When Jesus left, he left it with the 12 disciples. He left it then with the, the, uh, the, the first uh, century church. And he left it then to us. He left the world in our hands. And the problem is, is that we as believers are not following the one and two to the best of our ability or we would make a difference in our world. Are we doing a good job in our world? I don't think so. Now, you may have a disagreement than I do. I don't know. You may think we've just done a, a great job. <laughs> Right? But I believe that sometimes we got to bring back our focus to the one and two, to the main thing, and the thing that fulfills the main thing, the thing that Jesus is always all about, the things that, that God the Father sent Jesus for. Let me tell you something. The church is the last hope. Why? Because Jesus left the church as a gift to the world. But who makes up the church? You and I, we are the church. With Jesus Christ as the great shepherd, as the leader of the church, the head of the church. He is the head of the church. And when it talks about thy kingdom come, thy will be done. He's talking about may what, how you intended things to be established, to be established. That new kingdom that he's talking about is not an earthly kingdom. It is not a worldly kingdom. That's what the, the disciples and some of the people that day age got all messed up. They thought he was setting up that worldly kingdom. But what he was meaning by, by the, the kingdom, he was talking about uh, where, where like it talks about you're a royal priesthood, right? It says you are a peculiar people. He's trying to explain that you are different. You are set apart and you're not either. And he goes on other places, you're not Jew or Greek. And he's trying to explain to you that you're not a, a, a slave or free. You're not any of this. You are a part of the church. The kingdom of God. It is a kingdom that is outside this world. It is beyond everything that humanity has created. It is everything that we've dreamed up. It's not about being an American. It's not about being a Russian. It's not, it's not about being a, a part of China. It's not about being part of a Canadian. It doesn't matter where you come from. God is trying to declare he was setting up a kingdom that was outside of all of that. It was outside of all of that. He was trying to make us understand he was creating a global church, a church that would be seen around the world, that would affect the entire world, that would be outside of the governments and the process and the divisions of, of the, your male and your female, the divisions of your, your this ethnicity or that ethnicity, outside of the economic, your poor or your rich. And he's saying it's outside of that. And he's declaring to you and to I, be the church. You are the church. Be the church. So I'm going to talk about today what he meant by being the church. What are the main things in order to be a part of the kingdom that God has risen up? It is not a kingdom of, of, of necessarily dealing in, in realms that are fleshly realms do you know me, I, I am a, a, a person who believes that Christians should be a part of the political realm. I do. It just isn't the main thing. It's not the main thing that's going to bring change. 
I believe that it's the power of God and the Holy Spirit working on men's heart. And it is you that are going to make the main change. So today I am going to start as a series and I'm going to be preaching on a couple of these, uh, uh, on, on these, the, the main things that I believe will change the world, will change your life and will change your family's life. I want to turn to, uh, to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to start there today. Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to begin uh, in verse 17. It says, I hope I have you have in your Bible, but anyway, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. We're going to read the King James Version today. So if your version is a little, uh, you know, it uses different words, modern words, it, it, I'm sure it means the same thing unless you're using the wrong Bible and then you talk to me. <laughs> but anyway, there are wrong Bibles out there. <laughs> it says, from that time, Jesus began to preach. Uh, if you read in the previous, Jesus was being out, he's being tempted, he'd been fasting and he was tempted and uh, he overcame the temptations, okay? And then after he went and done that part of it, see, there is a, a, a process in everything. There is a process. There's a step by step. People like to skip steps. You ever, you ever, I want to skip steps sometimes. Let's just be, be, be real about it, okay? I like to skip steps, okay? That's just my personality. And actually, me and God had talked about it yesterday, sometimes about trying to skip steps. And it was not an easy conversation. And it wasn't me doing all the talking. Believe me, God was making me understand. He's speaking a still small voice, right? inside of me. And I knew I've skipped steps sometimes and all of us skip steps, but, but, but it's not okay. Um, but we need to just verify it. But, but there's process. And the process was that Jesus was, had lived out his life. He had uh, grown in knowledge with, um, uh, with God and man. And, and, uh, he had, uh, you know, lived out his life and now he was going into public ministry and, uh, he had been, went fasted and to prepare for that public ministry. And he got tempted uh, and he stood the temptation uh, and then he was ready. And so then it says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of God or heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother. Now, do these names sound familiar? These names are disciples. So if you're new to church, you may not know that, but these are disciples for you that are uh, been saved a while, you know that, uh, you know, these are disciples, future disciples. He saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, we're going to stop there for a couple of minutes, because I want us to uh, really understand this is the key verse today. This is the key verse. It's a very short verse. We can even shorter it more. We can say, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now, I want to talk, first of all, the first call of God, the first call that was given here. The first call here was that he told them that he uh, wanted them to follow him. I mean, follow. I'm sorry, to, be, to follow him, right? Follow me. You see, Jesus had been doing his... His, his prep work, he'd been spending a lot of time in solace. Uh, you know, he had, uh, he had been doing the things he needed to do to be prepared. Uh, and in actuality, God, Jesus had been spending time with the Father. He'd been spending time for, obviously, thousands and thousands, millions upon years. But he'd been spending time even in, with the Father in this new relationship, relying upon the Father. He had been... Uh, following God's plan. In one place in the scripture, it says, I must be about my father's business when he was actually very young. The point is that he was saying, I must be about following my father. Doing what my father wants me to do. Being close to my father. Following him. And so he'd been spending his time doing that, but in a lot of ways, he had been spending it uh, with, by himself in his own things and in his own temptations, in his own uh, plans. You might, it wasn't his own plans, it was God the Father's plans. But, but the point I'm trying to say was he was alone. And he decided it was time to start the ministry. So what did he do? He went 
where people were at. He went to the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is a, is, a, is a very much of a busy place. I was there a few years ago, and we spent a lot of time around the Sea of Galilee. It's more like a big lake than a sea, but you know what? It's, it's, a, it's a lake. It actually has a name, and I forgot the name of the kind of the lake as a lake, but, but we refer to it as the Sea of Galilee because it's so big and huge. They saw it that way. It has even small waves and, 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 and all those things, but, but the Sea of Galilee was the, a place where people fished and sold fish, and then they started selling other things. How many know if you want to sell a, a, a new coat, you go where a lot of people are, and you sell the new coat there, right? Somebody else selling fish, but you're selling a coat right the point is they went to where the people were at and it was the marketplace it was the place where people that uh, needed a, a change were at but but so Jesus w w walked uh, and he went to where the people were at the Sea of Galilee and he saw these men fishing doing their job going about their main uh, whatever their life was trying to take care uh, uh, of them and 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 and, he, and then he sees these men fishing and he declares to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Would he have ever been able to have seen these men or would he have been able to have done what he did if he would have still been on the mountain fasting and talking to God? No. Those men weren't up there fasting and talking to God. <laughs> Those men weren't around up there. They, they, there's no way he could have went and called people to follow him. He could not have done that without coming off the mountain, down where the people were at, walking along the sea, looking over and calling these fishermen and saying, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It couldn't have happened. You see, I believe that Jesus' example is the most powerful example for all of us. And we are to become disciples of Christ. We are to be followers of Christ. He wants us to imitate him all through the scripture. He says we, he is our example and we need to follow him. If Jesus, who had all power and authority, could call down any kind of miracle at all, if he had to in order to make a change in the world had to leave the fasting, the prayer, the things on the mountain and, and for that moment in time and come down in order to be amongst the people to get followers or people who would follow him and then be fishers of men themselves. How much more do you think we need to be where the people are at? Amen. 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 See. He understood, and so he went and he asked them to follow me. I believe the first and foremost thing that you and I should be doing, and that is we should be followers of Jesus. We should be followers of Jesus. Being followers of Jesus is as plain and as simple as that. Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus' example, follow Jesus' plan, do what Jesus did. Well, pastor, that's pretty simple. Well, okay. Maybe simple said, but sometimes it's not simple to do. Is that true? See, in our world, the, the number one most important thing that you will do for yourself is to choose to be a follower of Jesus. Now, I know most everybody in this room agrees with me, and I know some people might be watching me online. I'm here to tell you, if you want to change your situation, you want to change your world, you want to make things better, become, number one, a follower, a truly devoted follower of Jesus. Amen. Not, not somebody who just goes to church like I talked about last week for fire insurance, not just somebody who talks the good talk, but somebody who walks the walk. Be followers of Jesus, followers of his plan. Because see, that's the first step to change in your world. That's the first step to making things in your life better. By adding Jesus, seek ye first the kingdom of God. What's that saying? Is seek first the things that God wants you to do. Seek first to be in relationship with God. Then all this other stuff will be added unto you. Your job, your work, your money, your family, your relationships, everything else. All, right? 
God all through in scripture, I can quote him over and over. That's why I even mention that verse constantly. Because ultimately, if you <clears throat> want the success in your life, if you want to change your world, and if you want to give your chance, your kids a chance, the number one thing is not to, to teach them their ABCs. It's not, the, except for the ABCs that I talk about, but not the ABCs to read. The first thing is not to teach them, you know, even to respect authority, even though that's good. Even though it's not, the first thing that you must teach your children is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. <coughs> Now, if that time has passed you and your children are older and you didn't get that done, this is not a guilt sermon. You cannot change the past. Now you do what you can do to invest that into them through your example, through being the right kind of person now that follows Jesus. By, by visiting with them and talking with them and offering opportunity to them. And maybe you're not even in a talking relationship, so you can't even do that. I don't know where you're at. But if you've got children at home now, I'm here to tell you the thing you must be passionate about, the thing you must be desperate about. You must be desperate about it. I got to give my children a relationship with Jesus. I got to show them the way. I got I to gotta teach them the right things. I have to... Offer that opportunity to them. Listen to me. Nobody here wants their children to try to get through this ugly world without being a follower of Jesus. I'm encouraging you. Make sure that you give them the tools to be a follower of Jesus. This has this church. We have a ton of children back here. You, you, you a ton of children back, and that's important. I tell them all the time, I want a memorizing scripture. I, I want them to experience God. I want them to become followers of Jesus. Why? That's the most important. Yes, I want them to have some fun. It's fine. Let them have fun. Let them have a good time. Let them want to come to church. That's awesome. But let them experience the almighty God first and foremost. You want to change your world? And the time to do it is when they're young. When they become teenagers, it becomes more difficult. Can I hear a great big amen? amen. <laughs> Is it impossible? No, it's not impossible. It's even harder when they move out of your house. But what I want to get across today is that your number one responsibility is your children. But also, what about your wife? What about your husband? What about your, what about your friends? What about your extended family, your aunts, your uncles? What about other people around you? My point to you today is that we have to understand the way we change the world and be followers of Christ is we got to understand we got to be examples in front of them. Amen? Being a follower of Christ, teaching them to be a follower of Christ is important. Now, you know in this church that we're going we're to reiterate them. I like to do it about well, at least... Uh, one time, a lot of times in my sermons, I will mention the ABCs, but I don't tell you what they are. So if you've been wanting me to uh, tell you what they are, then you ought to get a, a pen and piece of paper and write them down. But I'm going to tell you what the ABCs are. Did we get that slide today? I asked them if they had an old one to uh, put it up for me. I don't know if we did or not. Is that a no or a yes? Okay, that's a no. Okay. So uh, I was going to have them uh, put up, but I asked them too late. I asked them about five minutes before church started. So uh, they didn't have an old one, I guess. We'll, we'll make one. So that whenever I say it, we can put them up. How's that sound? Even in the middle of service. But we're going to, um, but I want you to understand uh, the ABCs. And I'm only pulling them up in case I uh, uh, forgot something, but I pretty much know them too. Um, okay. And, and I want, sometimes about every few months, I want to I wanna reiterate them to you so you know them for sure. Because I believe this is what the Lord gave me to help people be followers of Christ. People a lot of times would ask me. How do people get saved and stay saved for 30, 40, 50, 60 years? How does that happen? Well, these are the key things that I feel like are in the Bible, following Jesus, being like Jesus, and then also the things, but they're simple things. Because how many know a whole Bible can be kind of hard to figure out how you follow that? Amen? Amen. And so I, I, I want you to know these things are very important because they will show you the path to being a follower of Christ. The A. What's the A stand for? Somebody tell me. There you go. Attend church regularly, right? Attend church regularly. Being in the house of God. If you want your children to grow up, to follow Christ, 
Don't skip church. Attend church regularly. Teach them it's the right thing to do, no matter what. Now, everybody needs vacation. I'll be skipping a service for um, a vacation. Now, I know you guys think I've been gone on vacation often, but I, I've been taking care of business. But anyway, and family and problem and, and then exciting things like a birth of a baby. And it's been a little rough. And then my brother and all that stuff. So there's been a lot of stuff happening in my life. But I actually scheduled a vacation that I don't want to give up because I know I need a vacation. I'm going to take a real vacation. And then, and then you guys got to call Pastor Gene and Pastor Donnie because, uh, you know, uh, my phone may not be with me. But... Uh, I'm going to go on a real vacation, unless you really need me. Everybody here knows I would answer your phone call. <laughs> but I'm going to go on a real vacation, you know, and that's, that's important. And I'm going to take time off, and I'm going to miss one Sunday. Uh, I used to try to schedule my long vacation where I only miss one Sunday. And so I'm going to miss one Sunday. Uh, because I believe going to church is important. And, and therefore, you need to attend church faithfully yourself to show them it's important. And even when other things come up that you would like to do, sometimes it's a good teaching moment for your children to say, no, we go to God's house on that Sunday. You're teaching on Sunday because that's what we do. There are certain times that we miss, and that's fine, but attend church regularly. Why do you think that I believe in, in, in attending church? Church regularly. I don't believe it's because I want you to learn rituals and all those things or, or to be some mandate that, that, that is around your neck or, or something like that. I believe it's because you learn good stuff when you go to the house of God. You connect to a real God. You experience God in worship. You hear him. People pray for you and you pray for others. We corporately worship. You cannot do corporate worship at home alone. It is not corporate worship. It is worship. It's fine, but it is not corporate worship, which God talks about. Your children learn from other people the same thing that you're telling them to love God with all their heart. It's your children. Going to church is important. And I'd like to hear a real big amen for that. Amen. All right, good. We'll stop there. What's the B? Be a friend to the lost. Be in the lost life. Have some non-believers around you. Jesus had to have some believers around him in order to uh, ask them to be followers of Christ. Amen? Amen. So make sure you do that. C, connect with believers. Connect with believers. Connecting with believers. You know, well, I go to church every Sunday. You know what? I'll be honest with you. There's really not a lot of connection nowadays on Sunday morning because you come in normally a few minutes before church starts uh, and then you stay maybe one or two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes after church and you're gone. There really isn't any connection here. Uh, Thursday night, we get more connection. It's a smaller group. We get a little more time to talk with each other. Yes, we're going to a system where we're all together now. So you will get an opportunity to, to engage a little bit, ask questions as well as talk to people. But I believe life groups are the future of our church where we have even more opportunity for connection. But you know what? You know, you're in church on, on, on Sunday and you're uh, at, at the midweek on Thursday. But I'm here to tell you that the rest of the week, you know what? I want to give you a secret. You're welcome to text or call anybody and, 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 and try to have time to visit with them. Maybe invite them over to your house. Right? Amen. We need to connect with other believers. Maybe invite them. You know, and, and if they got the big enough house, you invite yourself over to their house. <laughs> How many know that we're, we're, we're close to brothers and sisters? Would you invite yourself to your brother's house? Yeah. I would invite myself to my brother's house. Good. Right? I know that maybe doesn't seem right, but we're pretty close here. We're family. You know what I mean? But maybe you'd, if you got the money, you'd invite them out to eat. Maybe you'd invite them to a park. Maybe you'd invite them to the beach. Oh, yeah, we have a beach here. <laughs> I'm telling you, we need to connect with other believers. That's very important. And that's about following Christ. You want to be a strong follower of Christ? You want to do the number one, first, most important thing? The number one thing is that you ask Jesus Christ into your heart, ask him to forgive you of your sins, and, and you, and you, and you, and you uh, make yourself, make him the Lord of your life and say you will follow him. Then you follow him by doing these kind of things. Attend church, be a, be a friend uh, uh, to sinners, connect with believers. D is have daily time with God. Have daily time with God. You want to be a follower of Jesus? You cannot say you're a follower of Jesus if you never crack the Bible open. If you don't spend some time talking to him. It's important. And F, every, I'm sorry, E, every Christian, a minister or volunteer, do ministry. You cannot be a follower of Christ and not be doing ministry. 
Everybody should be a minister. Every member is a minister. Every one of us have gifts and talents. It may not be preaching, but it might be. Some of you may need to preach, okay? Uh, you know, some of you teach. Some of you uh, do some of those kind of things, but some clean and, and are uh, good at that. Other people do things uh, like marketing and, and, and graphic design. And people do all kinds of things, ministry. But do ministry. Find a place to minister. And F is focus on the fruits of the Spirit. I believe we need to focus on the fruits of the Spirit. D was a daily time with God. I see you got C. Maybe you need a D with daily time with God. <laughs> I don't know if she knows them all. Uh, F is a uh, focus on the fruits of the Spirit. Okay? The fruits of the Spirit. Really, we shouldn't have to focus on them. The fruit of the Spirit is supposed to be fruit of being a Christian. They should actually automatically be coming out of us. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. You understand? Those things should be coming out of us. Okay? But you need to focus on them in your life and be those things. And G, giving as a lifestyle. Giving needs to be a part of a life. Uh, God's a giver. He gave us Jesus. Uh, his character is wrapped up in love and giving. That's God's character. It's wrapped up in love and giving. And, and I really want you to understand that, that, that we need to have a spirit of giving of our time, talent, and our money. And our, we need to have a spirit of giving. You want to grow up in the things of God. These are the things which help you be a stronger follower of Christ. Amen? And what I want to encourage you is, number one, it begins with you. It begins with me. We are the church. It began with Jesus in that passage, taking a walk. It began with Jesus preparing himself for 30 plus years, preparing himself and, and, and to do that kind of ministry. He, uh, he, he did, he grew in favor with God and with man is what the Bible says, even as a, a teenage looks like a boy and into his adulthood. And, and then he spent time fasting and prayer on the mountain, walking through temptation, showing who he was following, that he truly was truly a committed follower of the father and the business of the father. And now he was showing us the path to changing your world is to be a follower of Christ. And you become a follower of Christ by if you do these things I've talked about here, it will get you in the right place where you'll hear the right teaching, hear the right messages, where you will let out of you so you don't, you don't let yourself become caught up in all selfishness. It'll help you be what you're supposed to be. Are there more things? Absolutely. There are things that come out of these things. There are things you learn, you grow, you're challenged. Like today, I'm challenging with something. But point I'm trying to make is if you want to truly be a follower of Christ, then you need to look at these things. So Jesus was out taking a walk. He had, he had showed that he truly was a follower of Christ. And he declared to us there are two things. Let's go back to the passage. He declared that there are two things that we must understand. He said, come and follow me. Number one, if you really want to be a, a believer, a Christian, a person who lives above the challenges, the problem. Not that you won't go in them. We're of the world and we're in the world. We're not of the world. You're still going to have challenges and problems and difficulties that challenge your faith. Just like we saw Jesus just came out of one. But the difference is he was the victor. If you want to be the victor, be a follower of Jesus. Focus on being a follower of Jesus every day. Not knowing all of the all of the deep things necessarily that really are little earthly good. Understand the most important thing that you want to know is you want to know him and you want to make him known. Amen. Secondly, he said, he said to them, he yelled out, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Let's read on. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Wow. <laughs> and what in the world is that about? I mean, to me, that's awful quick, ain't it? That's awful easy. I think there must have been some other seed. Uh, I think there must have been uh, some other knowledge. There must have been something they had saw before. And there is, there is things in other books that talk about that. But the point I'm trying to make, they knew something. The Holy Spirit had been dealing with them in some way. But the important thing is, they would have not ever been followers of Jesus if Jesus would not have left the mountain and took a walk and went down to the Sea of Galilee where people were hanging out. And he was on his way to change the world. 
He was going to be a follower of his father. Then he was going to go call others to be a follower of him. They left their nets and followed him. Verse 21. And, do, and going on from thence, he saw other two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Let's keep going. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Now, now he called them. How do you think he called them? He probably did the same thing. Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He didn't have to explain what he did again. He just asked them. He just shared with them. I've been a follower of my father, and I want you to come and be a follower of me, my disciples. And then, and they uh, uh, followed him. Verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. I find it very interesting that the first thing he did was he went and got some followers. He went and called out some people to be followers of him, right? And, and he offered them to be uh, fishers of men. Then he goes to the synagogues and he starts teaching. He starts preaching. He starts ministering what we call ministry. That isn't true ministry. True ministry is to do what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus came in order to give people a way to salvation. What? what saved from what? Saved from this mess. The way to turn the world upside down was to offer people to be followers of Jesus. The way we're going to make a difference in this world is to find people who need Jesus and offer Jesus to them and offer them to be followers and then offer them to be fishers of men and teach them how to be fishers of men. Amen. That's the way the world changes. The world, that's... If you don't believe me, then believe God the Father. That's the system he put in place. He believed that he sent Jesus, and Jesus gathered 12 disciples, and then if Jesus showed them how to be followers of him and, and to go and call people to be fishers of men, that, that eventually they would then go and, and call the, uh, the people uh, that would then get saved or under their ministry, and then those, the New Testament church, would spread the gospel all over the world. And then it continued to spread until it got to people sitting in Great Life Church 2,000 years later. Now, if you don't believe in the system, then take it up with God. Is that true? And see, I think that the enemy is trying to tell us it's all this other fancy stuff, this, all these other deeper things. We're more educated now. We're smarter now. We can read and make our own ways and our own things. And, and he's trying to explain to us it's as simple as taking a walk down by a lake of sea and reaching out to people and saying, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I don't know if today that language would be the language that I would use, but the concept is good. But if you don't know anything else to say, then say that and let the Holy Ghost work on them. Can I hear an amen? amen. <laughs> but I got a lot more to say. You know that. I could talk to people. I could talk to them about their life. He was talking to them about their work. He was drawing lines and conclusions, and probably there was even more that they knew about Jesus. Jesus had been around for a while. And so the point is there were other stuff there, but the point is... That he went at the right moment, at the right time, did what he felt he was supposed to do. And he went under the power uh, uh, of God and he went and he, and he offered for that. And, and in essence, he, he didn't necessarily start in the synagogue. He didn't start in the synagogue. He didn't start. He preached, preached the gospel of the kingdom. He's trying to preach of the kingdom. He's saying the kingdom has started. The kingdom is here. I am here, Jesus was trying to say. And I am the head of the church. And, and the church is being built. And healing of all matter of sickness. He's saying you go and, and he went and he healed sickness. And he healed disease among the people. Verse 24. And his fame went throughout all Assyria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments. And those which were possessed with devils. And those uh, that had the palsy. And he healed them. And just out with the people. He's praying for people. How long has it been since somebody told you they were sick and you said, can I pray with you when they're not a Christian? 
And they followed him, a great multitude of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Verse 26. Oh, that's right, 25. That's all there is. I didn't see. I forgot there was only 25. So the point is that, that he's trying to say is that I went out. I hung out with the people. Uh, he's showing what he did. He's calling people. He is he's trying to make people understand that, number one, you need to be a follower of Jesus. But number two, you need to offer them to be the same thing, to be those who go out and are fishers of men. You see, the disciples knew that it was hard to catch fish. They make a living at it. Some days it's very hard. But you know something it's interesting to me? Disciples caught fish, and then he killed them. He was, Jesus was offering them to do something different. He was offering them to catch, to catch those that have been killed or those who are dead and make them alive. Amen. Wow. That's good. That's what God wants you to be. That's what he wants me to be. That's what he's empowered us to do. It begins with being a follower of Christ. That's why I preach the words I preach about lining up to God's word, doing what God says, making God number one, attending church, doing the right things. You know, being a true follower of Christ. Why? Because I want you in heaven with me. But part of that is not just growing up and being mature and doing, doing those things. Part of the second part of it is, is he wanted to make people followers, but he also wanted people to be disciples, which meant a disciple. A disciple is someone who does what Jesus did. He wants us to go and find first our family, first those who are close, our friends that are close to us. But then he also wants to reach out to people we don't even know. And he wants us to tell them, I have something that changed my life. I have something that made a difference in me. I have something that brings peace into my life. And I want you to have it. I can teach you how to follow Jesus. I can show you. I can show you how to reach others and, and, and let them know that God can change their family. God can change the lie of the destiny that Satan says he has of, of, of sickness and, and being destroyed and not having nothing. I'm telling you the truth. You can share with them what God did in your life and then God will be able to do it in their life. The world changes. And your world will change and the world around you will change. And the dead will become alive. Think about it for a moment. I want you to think about somebody who's been a thorn in your flesh. Come on, think of somebody. I'm not going to ask you to tell me. Who's been a thorn in your flesh? Who is a problem in your life? Who creates and makes you think things that you should never think as a believer? Anybody? All right. Are you guys like me? You got people like that sometimes? They come along. And maybe it's some family member that's, you know, just gone nuts or crazy. Or maybe it's a child who really drives you nuts because you just, you try to do the right thing, but now it just eats you up. Or, or maybe it's a work friend or work mate. You know what I mean? I don't know. I don't know if you call them a friend, right? I love them, but I don't like them. You know that person. You know what I'm talking about? Because <laughs> Jesus makes me love them, right? See, I want you to think about that person for a moment. And how much anguish sometimes that causes you. How much uh, frustration in your heart. How much sadness. How much depression sometimes. How much you know, all the stuff that is opposite of the fruits of the spirit. That is opposite of love and joy. The, they're the joy sucker in your life. You know what I'm talking about? They're sucking all the joy. You know, or maybe you've learned to just put them in that little box and close the door. And you, and you know if you start thinking about it, you just take it and shut it again. You know what I mean? Amen. 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 But it can even get better than that, Jay, and I've done that, but it can get better than that even. Can you imagine if that person became a follower of Jesus, how it could change your world? Well, I'm not sure I want them to go to heaven, Pastor. <laughs> There's only one person in my life that I've ever struggled with wanting them to even go to heaven, but I'm over that now. <laughs> And, and there is usually someone in our life that we think doesn't deserve to go to heaven because of what they did to us. Some horrible things. But the ultimate, really, I want you to know is this, that 
I and you really don't deserve heaven either. And just because we know what they did, you know, and so we hold them accountable for that. And really, a lot of people don't know what we've done. Grace, amen? Now, that's a whole other sermon. But what I'm trying to get across to you today is that you can change your world by just seeing them saved. If, if you want good teenagers, then, then lead them to lead your children to Jesus when they're young. Get them to be followers of Jesus when they're young. And it makes being a teenager a whole lot easier. If you want a work friend to, to, to treat you better, you know what? Lead them to be followers of Jesus. Amen? We can change this world. We can make a difference. And the only thing that's left is for us to not only be followers of Christ, but for us to also emulate him and be disciples and offer other people to know Jesus. Amen? Amen. I'm going to conclude um, because I got a lot more to say about this. I believe that God has called Great Life Church and us as part of Great Life Church to change the world. To change this city. To change this county. To see change that will literally spread around the world. You say, that's awful big talk, Pastor. It's not me. It's about following the plan of God. And I believe that what you're going to see in people's lives, you can start by changing your world. You can stop by be, start. I'm sorry. You can start by being a follower of Jesus to the completeness of your possibilities, and then also you can go into the realm of offering other people to be fishers of men. You can change the world. You can get some of those that are horrible to you, get them more right. You can get people that were murderers and killers, and people in our society that hijack cars. They're, they're, they're not going to be changed by throwing them in jail, even though I believe in throwing them in jail. I'm telling you, they're not going to be changed by throwing them in jail. These people that are thinking all this craziness of taking over the world and, and using coronavirus as their, as their platform to control people. You're not going to change them by, by talking to them and, and they're making rules and regulations and laws and throwing them in jail. You're going to change them by having them, given them the opportunities to be followers of of Jesus. Amen. The number one power and tool we have is the food of Jesus said. I'm trying to get us all to understand completely and totally. If you want to make a change in your child's life, your wife's, your husband's, your aunt's, your uncle's, your mom and your dad, your neighbors, anyone else, the best thing we could do is see a, a couple of neighbors give their heart to Jesus around this church and it would make all the difference. Can I hear an Amen. And so if you really want to make change, follow the most important two things. Be a follower of Jesus and invite others to be a follower of Jesus. Amen. Good. And then you will see the dead come to life. You will see the broken healed. You will see those that are angry begin to have joy. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet.